The James Intelligence Briefing Program will consist of approximately 40 events during 2017 and is available to all customers of James Intelligence Centre and Module Products, including the Markets Forecast Products. Today we are joined by Ben Goodlad, the Principal Weapons Analyst and Lead Forecasting Analyst for the Weapons Portfolio, and Carl Dewey, CBRN Analyst for James. Together we will present a session entitled Missiles in the East, 2017 to 2017. 26 East Asia Missile Market. Following on from the election last year of a new US President, a change of government in the Philippines and a new leader in South Korea, there continue to be developments in the East Asia defence market and today we will examine some of the drivers for that activity, what is being procured and highlight any trends. But just before I hand over to Ben and Carl, I'd like to highlight the information used to compile today's presentation has been drawn from a variety of James content but particularly James Defence Industry and Markets. Further details about this product can be found by following the links, which you can see on your screen now. So during this briefing, we're going to cover four key areas. Firstly, um, Carl is going to examine the activities of North Korea, and then I will then lead on into what's driving the rest of the market. So once we've covered Korea, we'll then look at the other countries in the region. Leading on from the main drivers, I will then explore the East Asia market using data from James Market's forecast. This part of the briefing will focus purely on China, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan um, because of the data we have and, and the forecast um, activities that we have in this, in this region. I'll end the presentation by just examining the impact of ballistic missile defense. Just as we start off with, with North Korea and the activities that affect um, the missile market in the region, we really end with what the US is doing and how that has an impact on the region as well. So that's why we're, we're ending on the impact of BMD. As mentioned, North Korea is a key source of instability in the Asia-Pacific region. I'd like to start with a basic outline of some of the possible reasons behind its actions, which will hopefully lay the foundation for Ben's analysis of the missile space in the region. As such, I believe it makes sense to start with the North's nuclear program. Now, North Korea's nuclear program is surrounded by hyperbole. But one key statement outlining the nation's interest comes from the April 2013 law on the consolidating the country's nuclear weapons status. Alongside the various platitudes about how the North was compelled to gain nuclear weapons, two key articles help outline the official stance towards the state's nuclear weapons component, namely paragraph 4, which emphasises the defensive nature of the DPRK deterrent, and paragraph 5, which outlines that it will not attack non-nuclear states unless, of course, they are part of the nuclear alliance which are clear indicators that Japanese and South Korean fears of nuclear weapons are well-founded. Um, However, North Korea is developing its nuclear posture, and it looks like North Korea is moving towards a hybrid between asymmetric escalation and a min minimum deterrence strategy, one where at the local level uh, or regional level it will use uh, small nuclear weapons, with longer-range systems being designed to hold Washington at risk. The idea behind this, this being, of course, to get decision makers in Washington to pause for thought before it intervenes. Once a small ICBM capability has been formed, uh, it is possible that it will move structure. However, this cannot be told at the moment. So we've touched upon what is driving missile developments in North Korea. However, what about the other countries in the region? What I'll now do is outline some of the driving factors for each of the other countries that make up the region, starting with China. China is a major power in the region, both in terms of military and economic power. In order to preserve its position, China claims to be adopting a defensive posture. And when you consider that China has 14 separate neighbours with land borders, you can see why there is a requirement for a strong military force. This is before you consider its territorial disputes over the islands in the South and East China Sea. However, whilst China maintains that its actions are purely defensive, there have been efforts to exert its influence in the region through its military and economic might. Its missile forces fall under these two categories. On the one hand, China sees its PLA rocket forces as its main deterrent. However, its missile inventory and the threat it can pose in the region is also, uh, also a method of increasing its influence. So, for Japan, um, they again take a defensive posture. Um, they are constitutionally governed by uh, the Act of Self-Defense, um, however, this has also now changed to collective self-defense. So they are now able to defend their neighbors as well as defending their own territory. 
as I've talked about, there are territorial disputes within the East China Sea, um, and Japan does have these. It has disputes with both um, China and Taiwan over the Senkaku or Daohu Islands, um, and also has disputes with Russia as well. So looking at South Korea, um, clearly their biggest threat is from North Korea. Technically, they're still at war. The, um, there was no, never a peace treaty signed. Therefore, there is still a risk of, of even a miscalculation um, leading to potential conflict. We've seen this with its changes of artillery fire um, near the DMZ and also naval activities um, in the Yellow Sea, for example. So there have been naval and, and land-based clashes. What there haven't been are um, launches of ballistic missiles, for example. That would be a, a, a very extreme escalation, but it's something that South Korea both guard against. For Taiwan, um, like South Korea, they, they have a, really a single focus. Um, in the case of Taiwan, this is on China. Given the fact that the Straits of Taiwan are only 180 kilometers wide, that is their, their pure defensive outlook. Military action against China is unlikely um, unless Taiwan seeks formal independence. However, it must be guarded against, and, and that really drives Taiwan's defense procurement activities. Okay, so if I turn now to the East Asian missile market, um, this is all based on data from the James Markets Forecast uh, Missile Database, and it's looking at the market from 2017 to 2026. So we're looking at the a heat map showing, showing the region. Um, essentially, the dark red shows the highest value, and then the more orange the, the color, the lower their defense market. So as you can see, China has a... a 10-year market value of 37.66 billion, while South Korea has a market value of 10.83. So that's their nearest rival in the region in terms of spending on missiles. Taiwan, who has a need to um, invest heavily in its missile and, and air defense, has a total of 5.4 billion US dollars. And Japan, quite surprisingly, has a much lower market spend of only 2.19 billion. But it's also because there is an emphasis on other defense technologies, um, heavy investment in ships and aircraft, for example. So that's why, in terms of the missile market, Japan isn't as big a player as you would necessarily think from their, their side of the defense budget. So if we look at um, China now, what we're going to do is explore each country in turn and focus on their procurement activity and their individual markets. So within China, as I've said, their market value over the 10 years is $37.66 billion. Um, and that's on both production and development of ballistic of uh, missiles. Sorry, their focus is on both strategic and tactical missiles. So really, we're looking at both ballistic and other types. Um, in terms of tactical, their main effort is in fielding a really just to sort of like wrap it all up. Uh, there's been a, a number of factors in the influencing procurement and in the activities in the area. And North Korea is by far and away the most obvious. It's attitude towards the US and also Japan. The increasing building of China on reefs claimed under the Nine Dash Line and their territorial activities and military activity in the South China Sea. And the activity even of the US towards that freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. So there's a lot going on in the region. And there's been some significant ballistic missile development missiles for both tactical and strategic use, uh, and we've seen even in the last 24 hours the, the shore-based missile firings by North Korea. Okay, thanks for that, Carl. Um, I'm afraid we really have run out of time uh, today, and uh, it's unfortunate because it's a subject which we could keep talking about for, for far longer than, than that we have time available. Um, so as a, as a result, we're not going to be able to take any more questions. We look forward to welcoming you to future online intelligence briefings, and our next online briefing will be the U.S. Department of Defense FY18 budget deep dive that's taking place on Wednesday the 28th of June at 1500 hours in the UK, 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and we do look forward to welcoming you to that. In the meantime, thank you again for attending and goodbye. Mm -hmm.